Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Korea Economic Institute of America. Thank you all for coming. My name is Nicholas Hamasevich, and I am the Director of Research and Academic Affairs here at KEI. We are excited to be having this interesting academic paper series event today, looking at South Korea's defense industry. At KEI, we're passionate about the many success stories of South Korea, South Korea's rise as a greater player in Asian and world affairs, and furthermore, how South Korea's success stories and greater influence impact and help the U.S.-South Korea alliance. I think Dr. White's paper and presentation today will be able to illustrate how the growth of South Korea's defense industry is part of those dynamics. Dr. White's is a good friend of KEI, and we are glad he's here today. Dr. Richard White's is Senior Fellow and Director of the Center for Political Military Analysis at the Hudson Institute. Dr. White's is also a non-resident senior fellow at the Center for New American Security, where he contributes to various defense projects. Prior to being at Hudson, Dr. White's has worked for the Institute for Foreign Policy Analysis, the Center for Strategic and International Studies, the Defense Science Board, DFI International, Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government, and the U.S. Defense Department. Dr. White's got his BA from Harvard College, master's degrees from the London School of Economics and Oxford University, and he received his PhD from Harvard University. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Richard Weitz. Thank you. Thank you for very much for that kind introduction. Uh, I want to thank the audience for coming and thank KI for hosting me. Um, I also want to thank uh, Sam Aper, my, one of my interns, and several others who helped me do some of the research. I, had a, was ben I benefited from having a couple of Korean interns, which was very helpful. Uh, cause I, I learned Russian, that, not, not Korean. That was the thing to do in my, when I was in graduate school. It, it, well, is it? It doesn't appear. Yeah, I don't, I, is it on? It's on. Okay. Um, and so what I'm going to do, I'm going to summarize the key points of my paper, and then I'll, uh, you know, and then, then I hope we'll have engaged in an extensive dialogue, because I'm sure many of you uh, have knowledge of particular cases or aspects of the industry, uh, which can be very helpful in contributing to our greater understanding of the, of the issues. Um, as, as, as Nick mentioned, one thing that's struck many of us observers of, the, of Asian politics and just global politics generally is the rise of Korea in all sorts of areas. Um, it's, that includes uh, peacekeeping, that includes uh, economic development, includes promotion of democracy, uh, includes many, many areas, uh, many, and these have been often covered in past uh, issues of the academic paper series and, and related series at KEI. Um, what's also interesting is that this is also extended to the security domain. Uh, South Korea is taking a major role in nuclear nonproliferation. Uh, the South Koreans have contributed in, in, and served in leadership positions in various international organizations, including the United Nations, of course. And uh, despite the still smallish size of the South Korean economy, uh, it's, uh, it's managed an um, amazing rise to, from what it was decades ago to now major participant in the G20. And this is extended to many domains. Uh, for example, South Korea is now a very competitive provider of uh, civil nuclear energy services. And it's also extended to the defense sector, uh, which is very impressive since uh, it began, it, it, like some, uh, several other sectors, it really, South Korea started with very little and has managed to make a, a, a remarkable surge in this area. It is the third largest defense spender in Asia and the 12th largest in the world, and is also one of the largest importers of conventional military technology, even as its rising export status. It accounted for 5% of all global arms imports during the 2008-2012 period, of which a little more than three-fourths of that total came from the United States. However, over time, you've seen two trends. You've seen an effort to go beyond buying American-made systems, and you've seen an effort to develop South Korea's own defense industry through substituting for some of these imports, as well as through exporting uh, as well uh, defense items. 
and South Korea looks to be a, a major player in the fence market in years ahead, particularly in armored vehicles, shipbuilding, and some uh, airplanes. And this transformation, as with the transformation in many other domains in the U.S.-South Korean relationship, poses opportunities and challenges. Uh, the United States benefited a lot from some of the trends we discussed earlier. South Korea contributes very, uh, to helping realize U.S. goals in all sorts of regions and all sorts of domains. But it means both partner, partners have to adjust the, from the traditional pattern that they're used to, and that's always a bit of a challenge. So far, it's been fairly successful in the fence domain, but I have some ideas about how to make sure that that positive uh, net uh, benefits still continue going forward. What you've seen in, of course, just to recall, uh, recall where we where we are now is from where we came from. Uh, the end, at the end of uh, the Korean War, South Korea, of course, did not have a defense industry. And for the most part, it's been buying U.S. weapons for reasons related to countries' very close strategic alliance, the integrated commands and joint exercises between the two countries, the familiarity and legacy systems that the South Korea has acquired from the United States, and, and interoperability considerations. You want to make sure that the forces can uh, respond as effectively together as an integrated force, given the joint command. The, in the 1970s, South Korea first started to develop a defense industry, uh, but it took a, a little while for that to take occur. Uh, the motivation was some uh, military and defense, of course, giving access to have a little more defense autonomy, gaining access perhaps to, to weapons that are a bit more tailored to what Korea needed rather than what was available in international markets. But it was also related to the general strategy of parallel security and development, of trying to develop high technology industrial areas uh, which is the vision that South Koreans had for their country going forward and for the most part has been realized. And it's in some, for some it's considered a, a question of international status. If you want to be a great power, you, you should have some kind of defense industry to go with it. 1980s, South Korea was producing pretty unsophisticated combat equipment, rifles, artillery pieces, patrol boats, a trainer, aircraft, and so on. But the U.S. still had the dominant role. What, what the pattern you saw at that point was often South Korea would produce U.S. weapons on license, perhaps with some adjustments. And uh, the U.S. corporations benefited still because they could use this as an offset for more valuable contracts for more expensive weapon systems, fighter aircraft, for example. And they could often get the South Korean farmers to produce low-cost inputs for what U.S. firms needed to produce. And that helped uh, keep down costs of production for the, the Americans. And there was a lot of close relationship in terms of logistics and, and so on. Uh, and we still see a large number of weapons along this pattern of the South Koreans buying some of its most sophisticated weapons from the United States. This is the F-16 fighter, the Black Hawk helicopter, um, more advanced air, uh, missile defense systems, and so on. But we've seen a pattern diversification that has intensified during the 1980s and particularly 1990s when the South Korean governments were, at that time, were tr striving to gain greater strategic autonomy, uh, trying to, they made the decision, for example, at that point to request uh, a recovery of wartime operational control from the U.S. forces uh, and other measures. And the vision of having an independent, self-sufficient defense industry was part of this package. Uh, but there's also been commercial reasons why the South Korean uh, procurement officials will try and look beyond the United States when deciding what weapon they wanted to buy. Uh, it's not always the case. The U.S. companies provide the best deals in terms of cost, performance, and timeliness. 
Uh, there have been recurring complaints by South Koreans and others about limitations on the willingness of the United States to transfer technologies, for example, to uh, allow for co-production, uh, to provide offsets. And often they would find foreign company, uh, companies that were, more, and countries as well, if they were government to government sales, that would provide more generous terms in terms of willingness to transfer technologies uh, and allow for production within Korea uh, as opposed to uh, having to import systems. Now, it took a while for this trend to have an impact. Uh, the foreign companies often would either write off South Korea as a U.S. dominated market or complain it was just too difficult that because of all the networks of l legacies of systems and networks of informal ties and other considerations. So it was, just be, it was hard to break into the South Korean market. But over time, you, and particularly in recent years, you've seen major deals with non-U.S. suppliers. In 2011, for example, there was a, a, a tough competition between British Augusta Wayland and U.S. Sikorsky for uh, anti-submarine helicopters. It looked like Sikorsky would win, and the Sikorsky team was seen to be doing better in terms of the, mer the merits of the competition, but the decision was made in January 2013 to give the contract to Augusta Wayland. South Korea also, in more recently, in, in June of this year, chose to buy the Taurus KEPD 350 rather than Lockheed Martin's AGM-157 for their joint air-to-surface standoff missile. Uh, you've also seen major purchases of other European systems. The German uh, MIM-104C Patriot, for example, the K-2 Black Panther tank, and others, Mistral missiles from France and so on. Israel has become an important supplier. Uh, there's a 1995 Memorandum of Understanding in which they agreed to cooperate in logistics, and since then you have regular meetings between the two. Um, South Korea has turned Israel for advanced electronic warfare systems, uh, for radars, and UAVs and other uh, niche systems. In addition to this trend of seeking more foreign suppliers, you've also seen a deliberate effort of growing success to rely more on South Korean firms to provide systems that previously were imported. Uh, this is something that you can see this objective of re relying more on South Korean systems as early as the 1999 Rock Defense White Paper was reaffirmed in the Defense Reform Plan 2020 and so on. Now, many of the goals that were set in terms of def overall defense spending and other metrics were not totally met, but the trend has been to increase reliance on South Korea and increase funding of South Korean uh, research and development efforts. Now, at first, again, it was a challenge. The South Korean companies suffered from limited uh, private R&D uh, capital. Um, they were inefficient because they were small. They had a limited export market at first. It meant their costs were higher than they might have preferred. Uh, there were other constraints. Uh, so you still had a lot of licensed production of foreign military systems, such as the German Type 209 submarine and the USF-5 and F-16 fighters. But over time, you've seen the major weapon systems that have been purchased by the South Korean military that were made in South Korea, the T-50 tank, the KDX series of destroyers, the uh, main K-1 main battle tank, and so on. At this point, I would say that the South Korean uh, defense industry has particular strengths in shipbuilding, uh, some land ordnance, uh, and certain, uh, certain types of training aircraft, um, and it's developing new capa capabilities, uh, trying to develop attack submarines, for example, a uh, variety of UAVs. Now, uh, the South Korea has chosen uh, a model that's often followed by countries in terms of how it's developed its defense industry. They have not followed the Israeli-Taiwan practice, for example, of making it pretty much a government-dominated affair, of having the government design and, and test and develop and so on the weapons. 
But they haven't followed the U.S. model either of basically having the private sector provide most of the inputs with the U.S. government providing the funding and then sort of broad guidelines and periodic tests and so on to make sure the contract was. Uh, but they followed what often is called the, you know, the Japan model, relying on a small number of large industrial conglomerates, the Chables, such as Samsung, Hyundai, and LG. Uh, now, it's not, you, the government has been in heavily supportive of these efforts. It provides a series of direct and indirect subsidies to these manufacturers. It underwrites some of the research and development planning. It often ranges fares so that there's going to be one, mono, um, one supplier, one mono, monopolistic supplier of the critical military equipment, such as KAI and, and, and trainers and so on. And that's helped the, the industry considerably. Uh, the main mechanism the South Korean government uses is the Agency for Defense Development, which has several thousand people, engineers, scientists, um, does a lot of research on weapon systems, core technologies, testing some of the systems, um, prototyping, and so on. And there have been several papers I think I have referenced uh, on, how, on the structure and activities of the ADD. Um, but it also must be stressed that the South Korean defense industry has benefited from the overall improvement of the South Korean industry in the civilian sector as well. So a lot of the technologies we're talking about are dual use. They can be applied to our civilian or military purposes. Information technology, heavy machinery, shipbuilding, aerospace, and so on. Um, and it's natural that when you, you see this now in China, for example, and in Turkey and other places, when the defense, civilian industries in these kind of dual use sectors do well, then the country develops a defense sector which also be able to draw on these benefits, the, the, the structure, and, and that helps. Uh, then this has also uh, benefited from some of the qualities you often see in South Korean industrial production, uh, improving human capital, uh, productivity, but also government support, demand for technology transfer and offsets, um, and so on. And you also have the government uh, and the firms benefiting from this trend in terms of their export potential. The government naturally wants to encourage the defense industry to export where possible. It increases employment and high-tech jobs. If you get to produce more systems, that often will lower the price per unit of what you know, the South Korean military is paying for its systems. Um, the Lee Mung Bak administration saw defense industry as an engine of growth. It was one of the priority sectors. They were hoping, and I think this is still the goal, to have $4 billion in yearly exports and employ 50,000 people by the year 2020. Um, from what the data is available in the 2001-08 period, you see military aircraft accounting for the largest percentage of exports. This is 32 percent. This is the F-16 fighters, K-1 trainers, T-50 advanced trainers. Ammunition, 22 percent, and uh, offset base exports, 18 percent, and then some ground force equipment, another 18 percent. The United States has been the main purchaser of many of these exports. Uh, I mean, ammunition, parts, and services, often if the U.S. has purchased a large number of weapon systems and then gone on to start getting a next generation but still needs to service the existing systems, it's useful to do a draw on South Korean companies to provide the ammunition they need, the servicing they need, and so on, since those systems are still active in the South Korean inventory. And that allows you to also uh, save on, uh, get experienced workers and save on costs and so on. Turkey has been the second largest buyer, um, buying howitzers, trainer jets, and uh, components for its main, new main battle tank. Um, Southeast Asia, where, depending on how you define it, there is or is not an arms race occurring because of the rise of China, but it's clear that the defense budgets in all those countries are rising. 
um, South Korea has done quite well in, in with uh, certain countries, uh, in particular Indonesia in 2001 um, purchased the uh, T-50 Golden Eagle supersonic trainer aircraft, uh, making South Korea only the sixth country in the world to export supersonic jets. Indonesia has also purchased armored personnel carriers, infantry fighting vehicles, howitzers, and so on. And three 1,200-ton submarines, Type 209, uh, have been on the procurement list. And now they're thinking about uh, how they can jointly contribute to bear develop a next-generation fighter jet. So that will see them further linking together. And there's other... Uh, new procurement in the works and some anti-submarine ordinance and so on. Malaysia will expend from 100 to 400 million each year on South Korean arms, um, possibly Vietnam, Thailand's interested in stuff. Uh, India has become a newly important buyer. India has agreed to purchase some uh, counter mine uh, 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 ships. Um, the Philippines has expressed interest recently in purchasing uh, at, at least some of the T fifty, uh, the uh, the th th fighter jet version of the T fifty. Um, but there's also thinking that they're going to do some other work. There's an industry cooperation agreement of two thousand twelve, uh, two thousand thirteen was caused for exchanges in defense technology and more visits and so on. Uh, and South Korea might sell the Philippines some of its frigates. Uh, Saudi Arabia is recently signed a defense agreement and that if there's some sales to follow from that, that would build upon South Korea's say, earlier sales to Iraq and being able to be, have a foothold in that lucrative Middle Eastern market. Um, Looking forward, there's uh, the South Korean defense industry sees uh, openings in South America. The thinking there is a bunch of these systems are uh, countries are going to start replacing some of their old U.S. based systems, but they still might want to buy U.S. based legacy systems, but not from the United States, where it's very expensive and there's certain concerns about being too dependent on the United States. So that South Korea has an opening there to sell all sorts of errors. And this is starting to appear in Colombia in particular, uh, which is uh, looking to be a good, a good market. And even in Europe, uh, where there's a possibility, the, uh, uh, the President Park uh, met with the Polish president uh, a few weeks ago, and they agreed to, in principle, buy some of the uh, South Korean uh, warplanes uh, and uh, participate in some other joint activities. Um, now, what's often interesting in, is in several of these cases, such as we already talked about Indonesia, you'll see South Korea co-developing and co-partnering with another rising defense uh, uh, producer to jointly exchange military technology and, and so on, and still remain independent of the, the larger powers. Now, it hasn't all been uh, a rosy walk for the South Korean industry. They, like everyone else, they suffered some defeats. Um, they had a big setback last year when Israel uh, decided rather than buy the T-50 to go ahead and buy a trainer from Italy. They're also experiencing the same complications that many arms sailors do, uh, sellers do. The Indians, for example, were very demanding in terms of the offsets. So the South Koreans were getting a bit of the kind of treatment they, they've been trying to push on the U.S. to give them offsets. And so they had to, they've agreed to jointly produce some of these ships in, in, in Korea, some in India, and so on. Uh, China has explicitly objected to the possible sale of South Korean weapons to the Philippines, which, as you know, there's a major territorial conflict between the two. And it's also uncomfortable the idea of South Korea selling weapons to Vietnam. Um, in addition, it's still the case that South Korea's defense industry is very much focused on meeting domestic demand. Whereas Western countries export maybe a fifth, maybe a third, and so on of, their, of what they produce, uh, to, they sell to foreign countries. Uh, South Korea, it's only about 7% uh, 
of, of it. And the trade is still very much a negative in terms of South Korea buys about 8 billion more in the defense sector in terms of imports and what it's exporting. And that's the second largest gap uh, only behind India. Uh, one of the reasons is that in addition to the large domestic market they have with the, with the South Korean army trying to modernize under its various reform plans, uh, that South Korean firms still lag behind in certain key areas, aviation and electronics, stealth, um, some other areas as well. And there have been various discussions now about how the government can address these, these issues, uh, perhaps exempt some of the royalty payments that exporters are required to make, uh, encourage consolidation in the service sector so there will be a one-stop support unit in, in, the, in the defense design, and other initiatives to support exports. So overall, we should be a little cautious about exaggerating this development. It's not unique. We've seen this in the case of several other countries, uh, most notably China, used to be a major defense importer, particularly from Russia, as we've now seen with the Turkey sale, uh, sale if that goes through, uh, or even if it doesn't, it's still a sign that China is emerging very rapidly as a major player in the uh, defense market. Um, uh, Turkey itself is rising in its exports, uh, and there are other countries uh, that are, are trying to get to, to get into the global sector. Um, and there's a limited demand, the defense industry, global defense spending is sort of stabilized now, combination of fear of rising China, declining threats in Europe, defining defense budgets. I mean, it's sort of balancing out, but the cut end of the war in Afghanistan, but it's generally, it doesn't appear to be much of a growth sector for the moment. Uh, except on certain regional, in, in East Asia region itself. Uh, the U.S. still has an overwhelming dominance in terms of what South Korea imports. The uh, U.S. is also clearly the dominant global supplier of arms exports. Uh, and in terms of the net balance between the United States and South Korea, uh, for of, of all the imports that South Korea makes in the defense sector from the United States, only it only uh, uh, matches a very small percent uh, in terms of its exports. And it's clear that when it comes to the most advanced systems, U.S. firms often have a, a strong position. So we saw this in the, the uh, contested tender for the uh, next generation advanced fighter plane that of the three finalists, Boeing, Lockheed, Martin, were facing off against a European firm and uh, EADS. And uh, it looks like, it looked for a while like Boeing was going to win. Now it looks like Lockheed Martin's going to win. I mean, the U.S. still brings very strong strengths in certain areas, stealth and so on. Um, and this looks, and this probably will occur in several other domains. Uh, and particularly missile defense, insofar as uh, South Korea moves away from its traditional pattern of focusing on protecting primarily the Korean Peninsula itself and wants to have a, a more a wider range system either to help some other countries in East Asia or to protect South Korean forces that might be in employment in other areas. Um, and often they will still try, even if they don't see a defense, clear defense need, uh, prestige reasons come into play. I mean, I, it appears that some South Korean Air Force generals really wanted to have, if, you know, if, if Russia has a now stealth plane, U.S. has one, and Japan's buying one, and now China says it has its own, well, then South Korea <laughs> Air Force, same status as them, they, they should have an um, advanced stealth fighter. So that's why I think the Lockheed Martin's F-35 is now propelled to the front list along with some other factors. But this, isn't, this is only in, in certain domains. Elsewhere, uh, the U.S. doesn't have a clear advantage in terms of uh, the, what kind of defense technology they bring to the table. Often, there's, it's a matter of trade-offs. The U.S. firms will be strong in some areas. The European firms will be stronger in others, and so on. So in order to increase the uh, chances of the U.S. retaining some of these contracts, which I think is it's, it's not 
critical, but I think it's important that a lot of what South Korea buys is very at least compatible with what the U.S. has insofar as our militaries are so interconnected. Uh, until that changes, the interoperability should be weighed as a very heavy factor. Um, I think that one solution we should consider going forward in the U.S. side is to be more uh, open about buying weapons and other defense uh, items from uh, South Korea for our own forces. Uh, there's still a sharp net imbalance in, in, the, in the bilateral trade. In addition, and perhaps I'd say fundamentally, the, the real issue uh, should not be so much to focus on South Korea, but to think more broadly how to keep the U.S. defense sector competitive as the global market changes. Uh, there's, in part, this requires making sure that foreign companies don't have distinct advantages in terms of subsidies or, or other benefits that are denied U.S. firms. But it really requires uh, also that the U.S. complete some of the export reforms that are still in, in work and in progress that would allow U.S. firms to compete with their foreign competitors in terms of their uh, ability to transfer technology and so on. Uh, while still protecting the most valued U.S. secrets, I think there's a lot more room you can do in this domain. Thank you, and I'm eager for uh, questions, but also comments. As I said, I'm, I'm sure some, many of you have had uh, insights about particular sales or particular domains that I think would be useful for us to hear. Great. Well, thank you, Richard. So we'll open it up to uh, questions and comments. We have a couple microphones, so please wait for them and state your name and ask a question for us. So I think I saw a hand in the back there. Yeah, yeah, right here. Hello. Russ Ashford, I had a question about R&D. What sort of, where is the focus on R&D for their, to meet their goals for the 2020 uh, export markets? Are they focusing on submarines or any particular technology, that, including Chai Ball or AD&D or whoever calls the shots on that? Yeah, I think they still think aviation is going to be a strong sector for them. And it's also somewhere they're a bit lagging, so they have a double incentive. They have incentive because uh, export, you know, airplanes are very lucrative, and so it's good to be able to export in that domain. But it's also important for them not to be a lagger too far behind technologies. I think what they would like to get, of course, is stealth, being able to do some of that in-house, perhaps a bit more effective in terms of the information technology, surveillance. Uh, shipbuilding, of course, they can draw on their strong uh, civilian sector. Uh, and as you know, Britain, Britain just now is closing some of its defense shipyards. Uh, right now, China is very much on the rise in that domain, yet there are many countries that don't want to buy or at least rely on China for warships. So South Korea could certainly pursue a niche in that domain. I think that they're looking at UAVs. They've got a lot of UAVs in the works, but that's going to be hard to break. So does everybody. And missiles, a variety of missiles. I think they're considering, you know, one that's their scenario. They, they often rely on the ability to preempt any North Korean missile strike rather than rely on missile defense systems. And so far as they can develop some of that in-house, they can then have, be, have more flexibility in how, or more leverage in how they negotiate with the U.S. in terms of relaxing the missile guidelines for the next round. And it's something, of course, they can export uh, since the missiles are often seen as a, a, a useful tool for companies that countries that can't uh, necessarily spend the fortune of having a, mod, uh, a most advanced air force and sustain it. If you just have often missiles are seen as a, a cheaper substitute that can fulfill the same purposes. Um, the North Koreans are, are a good example of that. My questions, yes, up here in the front. Uh, Song Cho Ri with SBS from Seoul, Korea. Uh, I ask two questions. First, uh, very recently, at the end of last month, a uh, foreign policy magazine reported that uh, U.S. defense authorities uh, officials have a uh, huge concern uh, on South Korea's stealing of U.S. Uh, uh, cutting-edge defense technologies. Do you agree with that view? And the other question is, <clears throat> uh, South Korea is now exporting its uh, T-50 and TA-50 uh, trainer uh, planes, and uh, although you, the technology was based on the uh, Lockheed Martin's uh, technology. Uh, and South Korea is also considering uh, uh, buying, as you said, the uh, 
uh, buy more uh, F fifteen F 15s or F thirty fives. They're they're mulling over, which will go on idle. But uh, do you think that South Koreans need to uh, invest on developing its indigenous? Uh, fourth generation or fifth generation uh, fighters. Mm. Okay, so breaking that apart, uh, first about the the, uh, the the stealing issue. Um, it's tr it's hard. That's a tricky one. The, the writer stressed that I mean that many of the South Korean systems that they have are, look very much like American systems. Um, that may be because they uh, they misappropriated proprietary U.S. technology, but <laughs> it's been a long-term U.S. strategy to encourage interoperability between Korean and U.S. systems. And U.S. companies often wanted the South Koreans to produce systems that look like the U.S. so they could basically rely on those for their imports and parts and so on. So you probably have to break it down by case. Somebody needs to actually, or some people will not in one person, will need to investigate because I bet you it's probably different uh, by system. You have to look at the contract or with the technology transfer provisions. Insofar as if the South Korean military looks like a small version of the U.S. military that has advantages from the U.S. point of view, um, what I of course, you want to avoid is the Russia-China problem in which the Chinese develop systems that look just like the Russian one and then sell it and knock at a lower price than the Russians are, and that undercuts your, your market. Um, you know, I, this is this, this allegation is out there, but it's just an allegation. I'm, I think we're going to have to wait and see if we get any evidence of this from courts or whatever researchers. Do I think South Korea needs to have the capacity to develop a fourth or fifth generation plane? No, uh, not if their main threat is North Korea. Uh, they don't need that for purely defense reasons. But as you know, it's not just a, a defense consideration. As we, there's regions of prestige and status that there are many countries now that claim to be able to produce fifth or at least advanced fourth generation planes. Um, and so South Korea insofar as it sees itself in that same kind of uh, domain would want to have that capacity. Uh, there may be spillover developments in terms of the civilian air, air exports. Um, so in terms of defense, no. Uh, I'm not even sure if they need to have uh, it in their inventory as an imported weapon, whether they couldn't make do without uh, a, a fifth generation plane. There have been some arguments that if a war breaks out, they want to have the capacity to identify and destroy some of the hidden long-range artillery that North Korea might have or some of the mobile missile systems. Uh, but the U.S. might also be able to do that and are certainly planning to do that. Um, so really, I would say not only if, if you just use defense criteria do they need that, but that's not the only criteria they're taking into account. Other other questions? We'll go back. We'll work in the back there, and they'll come up. Uh, hey, Richard. Thanks for your presentation, Scott Snyder from Council on Foreign Relations. Um, your paper shows uh, really a lot of activity between Korea and Southeast Asia, uh, in particular. Uh, and I'm wondering whether you see political ramifications, ramifications for the political relationship between Korea and ASEAN. I also noted, you know, in your paper, you mentioned the Chinese political objections to some of those sales, and I wonder what you see as the impact of the fact that China has objective, objected you know, on the prospect for more extensive Korea-ASEAN dip diplomacy, uh, military diplomacy. Is it going to be a limit, or is Korea just going to keep on doing what it's been doing? Mm. As we know from your own writing about the dilemmas that, China, that South Korea is struggling with in terms of managing its relationship with China and the United States, it's a, it, it's a constraint that they're, they're still searching for the best way to deal with that. I mean, China is their main economic partner, at least in terms of trade, not necessarily in terms of foreign direct investment. Uh, China is also essential for resolving the Korean uh, division and, and achieving re unification. It has to be something on terms that China, Beijing is comfortable with. At least for, and in, for the most part, the thinking still is that China exerts some influence in decision-making Pyongyang so it can restrain uh, North Korean provocations. And so 
uh, President Park has made a, a major effort to try and reach out to China, including on a recent trip. On the other hand, uh, they do have um, a range of security concerns, uh, some of which they share with China, for example, with respect to Japan, but often differ. Uh, South Korea is developing its relationship with ASEAN rapidly in all sorts of domains. So far, they have said that they will note Chinese concerns, but they they don't consider them decisive in how they're going to deal with terms of at least the defense relationship with the Philippines. That's where it's most advanced. Um, looking forward, uh, it's, it's, I mean, as you know from your own work, you, we're going to have to break it apart because the different ASEAN countries differ a bit in how they're going to fall out on this. And so China will feel more comfortable with some relationships but not others. But it's, it's an interesting question. I mean, South Korea is really struggling to figure out how to deal with this. So far, their thinking is they should have a strong relationship with the United States and a strong relationship with China. They, they can try and leverage one off the other, and that's actually helpful for them. Uh, that China is changing its attitude towards South Korea, feeling less threatened by what South Korea does. and so. Even if the Chinese are expressing objections now, maybe those will decline over time. But it's, you know, they're sort of in an uncomfortable geographic position. They're so close to China, so dependent on it for here and economic decisions. It's got to be something that they're going to have to, uh, and as we, as we are too, think of research that as they're going forward. It's, it's definitely going to be a constraint on some of their activities, particularly with countries that are very sensitive for Beijing. Uh, Vietnam might be might also appear on that list. Um, I'm sure it's constraining what they're doing with Taiwan, for example, too. And if they ever reconcile with Japan, that's going to be an uh, an issue. Other, other, yeah, we had a question. Here. Yeah, Hyo uh, Dong Ro uh, with the Yonam News Agency. Uh, you know, uh, there's a controversy uh, within uh, South Korea about whether. South Korea is in the U.S. MD system or developing its own MD system. You know, uh, South Korean government said that the country is, um, the country's MD system is separate from the U.S. MD system. As a um, defense industry analyst, um, what is your view on that? I mean, I would not ask the political side. I would not ask you uh, about the technical side. Right. Okay. I actually have a paper that just came out with the Asan Institute about uh, the missile defense issue and South Korea and in, in, in the U.S. Um, I mean, South Korea's objections, well, let me put it this way. The U.S. would like, although hasn't really demanded, that South Korea join, follow the path of Japan and others and help them develop a regional-wide defense system against North Korea. Uh, they could include uh, contributing sensors, interceptors, technology, co-production, all range of activities. The South Korean position is, for the moment, they are concerned about North Korea's missiles. They're trying to develop a Korean uh, air defense missile, uh, missile system to protect the Korean people and Korean forces and the U.S. forces on the peninsula, and they're willing to cooperate with the U.S. forces on the peninsula to deal with that threat. Uh, what they're not willing to do is, is sign on to any region-wide defense system. Now, the arguments in favor, in addition to synergies you get, uh, and perhaps lowering costs, is that South Korean forces might be, as they have in the past, find themselves somewhere in the Gulf, for example, and so they'd want to have missile defense protection in that case. Uh, the arguments against are strong. Uh, they range from um, that's not their main concern. Really, isn't North Korea's long you know, maze missiles? It's more that front-range artillery and, and other factors. Since there's a limited amount of funding, they have to find what the trade-offs are. That means they can, um, you know, they're not going to put money into missile defense and empire priority issues. They seem to have a more preemptive vision. They talk about, you know, the, the hitting North Korea very early in the chain before it even launches its uh, its missiles. Um, there is uh, concerns about um, they, they want to make sure that they don't rely too much on U.S. technology in this domain. Uh, 
uh, and there are other factors that are strong. The U.S. might be able to reduce some of these objections just in the def defense industry domain is if the U.S. were to do, for example, if they'd done some of the European cases in which they would give contracts to South Korean firms to develop missile defense technology that had some influence in getting NATO to back the U.S. defense in initiatives in Europe and certainly helped in Japan, it might prove useful in the case of Korea. Okay, any other, other questions? Yeah, right here in the front. Uh, thanks, Ken Yates and Jefferson Waterman. Um, back in the you know, mid-60s, the late 60s, the Park chung hee government established a thing called KIST, which was to accelerate uh, Korean capabilities in scientific uh, work and uh, developing industries, and that led, of course, to the electronics revolution. Um, do you see anything comparable at this stage in the Korean government's efforts to back the development of Korean science uh, to the point of developing other industries such as the uh, avionics and um, electrical and uh, technical uh, requirements for defense systems? I'm going to have to pass on that one because uh, I, I just don't know. I don't want to mislead you on this. I, I haven't, I've, I've not seen it in, in an effort to create, for example, a DARPA along the U.S. model. I mean, the Russians are now trying to do this. But broadly, in terms of the scientific, that whole industrial area, largely, I, I can't really say I have any expertise. There probably is somebody in the room, though, who could answer that, if not in KEI, if, if anyone wants to tell us the answer to that one. Uh, or we can take that for the record, <laughs> and say. Okay, any other, any other questions? Yes, please. Uh, my name's Kevin Kim. Um, so the, the South Koreans recently introduced a sort of a new operational concept of, as you've mentioned um, a few times, of sort of preemptively striking or de deterring North Koreans. Um, from what you've seen, um, all the new sort of defense acquisitions and procurements and development, um, does that fit the, the new concept? Does it fit the new doctrine? Or does it, uh, if, if not, then what are the missing pieces, in your opinion? They are making progress towards that. The idea of being able to preemptively strike uh, North Korean uh, missiles that, or long-range artillery, uh, this was often came up in the, in the negotiations to relax the missile defense guidelines that South Korea had accepted with, under U.S. pressure to limit the range and payload of their missiles. And certainly, insofar as they're developing longer range ballistic missiles, uh, cruise missiles, UAVs that can help target that, that's helping them do that. They're also made some procurement decisions which will help them deal with the kind of provocations we saw in 2010. They have better now anti-submarine warfare systems. They have better counter-battery uh, systems in the, in the works. Um, but uh, people, defense analysts looking at this are a little concerned that there's some other scenarios that perhaps they're not positioning themselves well for. Uh, and for example, if for whatever reason you see a collapse in North Korea and, and then what you need is to have the South Korean military go in very quickly and you know, re retrieve the nuclear weapons and other junk there, uh, deal with humanitarian crisis uh, and so on, ideally with a minimum U.S. role. And for that, you don't need all these high-tech systems. You need a large military, basically, and many ground troops. And they're moving away from that. And as you know, they're cutting back in the size to, in order to pay for it. They're, they're, they're following the pattern in many countries, reducing the size of the military and developing high, you know, more technology. Uh, and that means that there are going to be less troops available if there is a, such a scenario. Uh, the reserves are not being, uh, they're, they're reducing the, the number, how much training they're getting and how many they're going to have. Uh, and the fear people have is that means they may have to rely on China, for example, to come in and occupy the North. Which may, China may or may not do otherwise, but it would be, it'd be not welcome <laughs> if, if, if that's South Korea has to rely on China to, to help deal with the crisis in the North. The alternative would, of course, be U.S. troops, but the number of U.S. troops, uh, even though it's staying the same, they're, being pulled, they're moving farther south, and, and that would, of course, make China very uncomfortable. So in terms of the preemption scenario, they're making a lot of progress, often sometimes to the alarm of 
people in Beijing and perhaps sometimes in Washington in terms of their capacity to undertake such a scenario. But there are, there are other scenarios they're not positioning themselves well for, um, such as unification under, you know, under, uh, under some kind of uh, non-conflict but still uh, strenuous circumstances. Okay, other, other questions? In the back. Uh, Mr. Walsh, thank you for sharing your thoughts today. Uh, my name is Brian. Uh, as you mentioned, the uh, arms trade between U.S. and Korea is heavily in favor of, I mean, you didn't say heavily, but in favor of U.S. Uh, for many factors, uh, such as uh, technology or um, uh, some regulatory holders like Barry Amendment or Bio-American Act or... Uh, and and even the uh, the small amount of uh, export from South Korea to U.S. was uh, largely uh, because of the offset trade obligation. And and if you if if, if you could uh, give some tips to uh, uh, South Korean defense company who would like to you know export to United States, uh, uh, what would it be? And also, have you seen any uh, efforts by South Korea or government wide uh, side? to, you know, have that kind of regulatory hurdles changed? Um, that's an interesting question. It's very complicated. Um, it's something that's, uh, to sell more to the United States, it's difficult even when, because there, I mean, there's so many other factors that come into play. South Korea wouldn't be the only supplier. They've got to compete with Europeans. It's not purely an economic decision. Uh, I think it's important that the U.S. takes South Korea seriously as a supplier for reasons I gave, that as far as this, you can reduce the imbalance, that will reduce pressure on the South Korean government to reciprocate by, for example, denying U.S. access. But in terms of advising them how to do it, it's, I mean, there's no, there's no easy answer to that one. It's case by case, requires, I mean, they're doing the right things, but there's just a lot of competitors and just a lot of structural barriers. The U.S. officials often want to buy American for all sorts of reasons. Okay, any other questions? Yes, please, up front. Hi. Hi, Wan Jin from Booz Allen. Um, cyber espionage has been an issue, especially coming from North Korea. Do you know if um, the South Korean government or these defense companies are doing anything to protect these new defense technologies? That's a good question. I mean, there's certainly where everyone's more aware now of C North Korea's growing uh, capabilities in this domain with some of the attacks we saw previously. Uh, in terms of espionage, I'm not sure if North Korea is the main threat. Uh, there's probably another country in, 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 in near there I'd be concerned most about. And how they protect that, that probably requires, uh, I mean, it's going to require very robust defenses since U.S. companies have found themselves ravaged by these attacks. Uh, to, and so they're probably going to have to look at what the U.S. companies are doing and other companies and figure out their defenses. It's difficult, though. Uh, to, uh, in terms of North Korea, it, uh, we have to be careful because we often underestimate their mischievousness, and so we get surprised when they sink a warship or, or actually launch a missile that, that, that makes it into outer space and so on. So who knows? They could do some things, but I, even if they were to get the blueprints and so on, I don't know if they could actually, you know, emulate and create a, you know, a, a South Korean, Amer you know, Western type modern uh, conventional weapon. Um, so I wouldn't, I, I, if I were them, I'd focus on a th other threat. Okay, other questions? Richard, maybe uh, for one of my questions is, can the, def you know, you wrote in the paper, the defense industry trying to be an engine of growth. I mean, can, they really, can the defense industry really be an engine of growth? Is, or what does that really mean when, they, when the Korean government thinks of it as an engine of growth? Especially when you're talking about the balancing out of the defense industry across the across the globe. Yeah. I mean, you're right. That's, uh, that's uh, something we've been struggling with. I mean, as you know, it, the traditional the pattern was that defense industry in the U.S. 
would develop a, you know, this great high technology through DARPA or whatever, uh, and then that would be ported over to the civilian economy, and, mm -hmm. and and then U.S. systems could do you know do quite well in terms of their their sales. Um, and in the Korea, but we've everyone's moved away from that spin-off model. Often it's the other way around now that you rely on Microsoft or somebody to develop the great capabilities that you then bring into the defense community. I guess it's the more conventional interpretation of. If they can sell more abroad, that creates more high technology jobs uh, yeah. that you know bring, brings in uh, revenue they can reinvest in. So I, I think it's it's just that. But I would be surprised if uh, if they were to put too much emphasis on that for the reasons you gave. I mean, they just have so much potential in many other domains. Uh, I. I would think that they, and I think they have a very balanced, they would like to improve the capacity, but it's not uh, a priority for them the way, for example, it is to the Chinese, who are really making right, a big push in this domain. Okay. Any last questions? If we don't have any more questions, please join me in thanking Richard Weitz for this yeah. great presentation. Yeah. Thank you for coming.